Hey friends, this is Pastor Brian Savage, Senior Pastor at Heritage Church, and I want to thank you so much for joining us once again right here at Beyond the Sermon. Hey, today I have, uh, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be biased or partial to him, but I have one of my favorite guests on the show, the one and only... Tim Howard. How are you, Tim? I'm doing great, Brian. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. It is so good to have you back, my friend. Um, I have just always, always enjoy our time together, whether that's on a podcast or just hanging out with you. You are a, uh, a wealth of wisdom, and uh, it's just really good to have you. Thank well, you. Well, thank you for that. That's very kind. Hey, uh, friends, if you don't know, uh, uh, Pastor Tim Howard, uh, he, uh, God has just used him in so many incredible ways. Um, Tim is the founder of Wellsprings International, Wellsprings of Freedom International. Uh, he is also an ordained uh, Wesleyan pastor in our denomination. And Tim, you were just saying this before we started recording. Um, you and Gracie have been attending this church since the late 70s. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. So, uh, Pastor Tim, uh, you have been attending here since 19, was it 78? Yeah, 1978. Incredible. Um, the first Sunday that Gracie and I came to a service, there were 50 people. Incredible. And so we've had the wonderful privilege of being able to watch what God has done as he has just expanded the church, grown the church. And to just see through the years how he moved in amazing ways to, to bring us to where we are today. That's right. It's awesome. It's awesome. Well, Tim, as you know, we have started the, the new year with a new teaching series. And the series, I really felt like Holy Spirit was, was asking me to preach and really help lead the congregation on this journey of intentionally dwelling with the Lord this year. And so when I really started processing that assignment from the Holy Spirit, um, it just seemed like it was the right thing to do to first start this series off with the biblical spiritual discipline of fasting. And so for all of those who've been a part uh, of this series so far, that's where we started. And we learned that fasting is a form of worship. But we also learned, is really incredible, almost every time you see the word fasting in Scripture, that word prayer follows. Well, so that's the reason in the second week of the series, we talked about prayer. And so uh, a week ago, we really, I really tried to help everyone understand um, some basic principles about prayer. And if you want to intimately dwell with the Lord, here's how you might want to pray. Well, that brings us to this week, the third week in our installment of the series. And Tim, for me, it was a natural progression. If you're going to talk about fasting, you have to talk about prayer. And if you're going to talk about those two things, you most certainly have to talk about biblical meditation. Now, Tim, this is a word <laughs> that, this meditation word, that... I think can sometimes scare Christians a little bit. One of the things I tried to do in the message um, this weekend was to sort of first set the ground rules of here's what secular meditation is, meditation that's based on different religions, false religions. Here's what biblical meditation is. And I was very quick to make sure everyone understood there's a huge difference. Huge difference. Let me just review that very quickly, and then we're going to dive deeper. So what I tried to really bring out in the message this weekend is that secular meditation focuses on emptying the mind of clutter. So we're supposed to empty everything in our mind. That's what's going to make us better or whole, right? Secular meditation would also, t uh, would also focus on that it, you're meditating for me. And I'm meditating for how I can escape the chaos of life and how I can escape the negative inner thoughts that I'm having. Secular meditation would also teach us that if you're meditating from a secular perspective, you're trying to find power from within you. You're trying to find your inner power so that you can be healed and restored and made new. And sadly, what happens with secular meditation is that leads you to being your own savior. If I can meditate enough, let me just say this. Let's just get very real. Uh, 
a big secular med- form of meditation. Uh, you see practices. Hinduism is talking about chakras and getting to these different levels uh, inside of your body. And if you can attain these levels, you'll be one with the world or, you know, whatever, right? Well, secular meditation is all about emptying the mind. It's all about me. And it's all about finding myself as the Savior. That is not biblical meditation at all. Let's review biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is first and foremost filling the mind. It's the complete opposite, right? Secular says you've got to empty it. Biblical meditation says, no, 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 no. You need to fill the mind with God's word. Second, for biblical meditation, what I tried to bring out is that you don't start with me in biblical meditation. You start with he, You start with God and how in meditating, you're going to delight yourself in God. You're going to find the peace and love of God. And that's what you want to enter your heart and your mind and your soul. And then the third form, or excuse me, the the third um, uh, biblical point of biblical meditation is that in biblical meditation, you're not looking to yourself as the savior. In biblical meditation, you are finding the power of Christ for his healing, for his restoration, and you are looking to Christ to be your savior. Okay. So now that we've kind of reviewed the the differences between secular and biblical meditation, let's start here. Tim, why can you give us any thoughts on how secular meditation practices? So what we see out there in other religions or what our culture says is meditation. Have you seen like, does that hurt Christians? when we're influenced by what I would call these wrong ways to meditate, how are we influenced by that? And have we become a generation that has sort of lost sight of biblical meditation because of that? I I think so. I think it can hurt us, um, especially if if we buy into any of that, you know, and we step into that and we find out that it is really kind of empty. Um, But I think the church, because of how it's been used in the secular world, it causes the church to go, oh, we're not going there. And that causes us to run away from it. And so we don't look into what it really is, and we kind of run away from the practice of it. And um, and we kind kind of throw the baby out with the bath water. You know, there is good, God has called us to it. It is scriptural, Um, but it, just like everything else, Satan has a way of taking everything right. and turning it into something it was never meant to be. And so I think that what we've done is we've run away from it because of what it's been turned into. And we don't realize that God has called us to it. And it's really good for us. if We can step into it. The cool thing about scriptural meditation is we're inviting God into it. You know, we're not alone. We're not sitting there just doing this thing on our own. We are we're in the presence of God. We're practicing the presence of God in many ways. We are dwelling with him. And and when anything you bring Jesus Christ into with you, um, it, it's going to be good. That's right. Amen. I didn't really I was I didn't have the time to touch on this in my message. Let me just ask you this question. Would it be harmful for a person who, who's a Christian, would it be harmful for them to start practicing biblical meditation, but to also incorporate secular ideas of meditation? Yeah, I, I don't think I would, I don't, I, you know, why would you want to mix secular with what God has designed? Now, you understand that is exactly what Satan would want us to do. He would, he would want us to mix a little bit of the dark side in with the light to get it all, you know, kind of all jumbled up in a mess. Um, I'm reminded, <laughs> this is years ago, Brian, I wasn't even planning on saying this, but I was, I'm reminded of how Gracie and I went on a, um, we went on a, I think it was our 25th wedding anniversary. Um, we went to Punta Cana, it was in the Dominican Republic, and we were in the hotel room and I was watching a video and they were talking about the religion of the country and they talked about how it's a mixture of Catholicism and voodoo. Oh my goodness. And you know, I just sat there looking at the screen, I can hardly believe it. I'm like, how do you 
How do you mix, mix those, those two things? things. <laughs> right. um, for me, right. mixing secular meditation with biblical meditation would be along the same lines. I just think you're, you're inviting crud into something that's meant to be Absolutely. beautiful and wonderful. That's right. That's right. And I, I would almost say, I, I think there's a danger there. Uh, because, and, and maybe you could touch on this better than I could, but kind of feels like if you're bringing in some um, practices of a false religion into your meditation time with the Lord, it certainly seems like that would be opening up a door for Satan. It can. It really can. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt about it. I mean, what a lot of times, a lot of, you know, and I don't, how do I say this? Let's just say you are opening doors to things you don't understand, things that can have some negative effects on you that you don't even realize are happening to you. That's right. So it would be very good for us to say that when you enter into meditation, you need to do that biblically. And anything that is not biblical that maybe you've learned or heard from uh, the secular world, you probably don't want to incorporate that into your time of meditation. I, w- I would agree with that, yes. Yeah. Tim, let's, uh, let's go here. So I touched on this briefly in the message, but why should we engage in biblical meditation, right? So I think that's a very fair question. Um, I really brought up two points, but let me bring up a pre-point. <laughs> Here's a pre-point. One, we should do it because the Bible tells us about it, and we have many examples of some of the heroes of the faith meditating. I mean, we see the word uh, meditation and meditating on God's word many times throughout Scripture. So as a pre-point, one, we should do it because Scripture talks about it. But two, to get more practical, what we learn in Scripture, and I I threw out some of these verses in the message, Romans 5, 1 through 2, Romans... uh, Eight, uh, five through six, uh, Proverbs two, one through six, I believe. First, it's to deepen our connection to God's goodness, His peace, His wisdom, His word, and even His will in our lives. The second reason we should engage in biblical meditation is now it's a benefit to us. So that first one was all about God. The second one is really about how in meditation, in God's word and on who God is, that'll also renew our minds. That's the place where we might be transformed into the image of Christ as we're meditating on God and his word. So with that, let me ask you this question as we go deeper. So this weekend, we talked about meditation. We talked about meditative prayer. Tim, what are some things that maybe you have learned about meditative prayer throughout the years? Help, help guide us into maybe a deeper understanding. That's a great question. You know, uh, it prob- it's been over 30 years. I'm going to say sometime in, in the 90s, I read a book by Richard Foster, and, and it's just called Prayer. But it, it's called Prayer, The Heart's True Home. And I, I will tell you that I, have, I still have the book. Um, it's so marked up. I mean, every single page in the book I've marked. Now, he, he talks about probably 25 different kinds of ways to pray and he each chapter is kind of a different way to pray and he talked about meditative prayer he talks about contemplative prayer he even talks about a prayer of rest um, it, they're just different ways and different ways to practice it but he but it goes it went way deeper than that um, he taught I was always kind of afraid of prayer didn't feel like I did it very well and and so he was able to write the book in such a way that it helped me to be confident to begin to pray because I thought I had to be perfect at it right from the beginning and you don't it takes some practice you know so but what I would say is one of the things that he taught in his book is that meditative prayer is internalizing and personalizing the word of God so it's for us so it's to take the scripture verses and and as we're dwelling in that scripture passage looking at it in such a way figuring out how do i internalize this how do i make this scripture passage um how do, how do i make it something that is going to change me how is it going to help me to become more like christ and and how do i put myself in a place where i can allow that to happen in a busy, busy world. And so those are some things that I really, it really helped me to, to practice finding a place where I could just 
quietly internalize, personalize scripture versus how do I apply it to me? What can I learn from this? Those kinds of things to make me um, closer to Christ. Because I'm, the cool thing is, is in the midst of this, yes, you're looking at his word, but for me, and I, I would hope that it's for the same for most people, I feel as if I'm in the center of his presence as I'm doing those things. So I try to find a way to get to that place. What, what's, but, but also, what's interesting, I, I, would you mind if I read a, a Oh my goodness, a please quote. do. Yes. This is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. One of my favorites. And he says, just as you do not analyze the words of someone you love, but accept them as they are said to you, accept the word of scripture and ponder it in your heart as Mary did. He said, that is all. That is meditation. <laughs> and I just think, you know, to, to take the word of God as it is, not trying to sit there and break it down in a hundred different ways and all that, you know, it's, we do that. But when we're in meditation, it's a more personalized yes. time. It's a quiet time where we can ponder his word, what is he saying to me? Yes. Yes. Not trying to break it down, just accepting it for what it is. Yeah. And there's something very precious and sweet about that. Man, that is gold. <laughs> that is gold. Because he here's the thing, and I think this is really what uh, separates uh, meditation and study. When you're meditating... Uh, biblical meditation, that's not the time to have your commentaries out. That's not the time to have some different books out where you're referencing, okay, what does this passage mean? This isn't a study time. Meditation is exactly what you said. It's more of the application time. It's more of the, it's more of the drawing closer to God and allowing, allowing God to start doing an inner work in you. Would that be fair to yeah, say? Oh, I, think it's, I think it's dwelling with God. Yeah. And let and and putting yourself in a position where you let him speak. Yes. Oh, that is so so good, so good. And we're not we're not really good at that in America of pausing yeah. and being quiet and just allowing God to speak to us. Yeah, we got to do better in that area. Yeah. Tim, let me ask you this. Um, Going to kind of go the opposite way now with, but. If we, okay, so I preached this message this week. We might have some people for the very first time considering starting to biblically meditate. What would that mean? They're considering, hey, I'm going to start trying to do this. What would maybe be a hindrance to yeah. meditative prayer? Oh my goodness. What might hinder us in that process? There are many hindrances. Let's talk through that. I will tell you, I mean, uh, as I was studying this book back in the 90s, I would come to I would come to the church at six o'clock in the morning, sit in the sanctuary, and I'd try to sit for an hour in absolute quiet, trying to dwell with God and try and I tried to practice what I was reading. And and I can tell you from experience some of the things that I that I did discover were hindrances for me. Um, one, we have to understand we have an enemy who does not want us to dwell with God. He doesn't want us to. Um, and so he's going to throw everything at you you can possibly think of to keep you from getting to that. To that, I will just tell you, I would. I, I felt like by practicing this, I reached a point where, as I would sit in the quiet, I would feel myself entering into the presence of God, and then I could talk. Then we, I could hear him talking to me. And we could have conversation, and it's a very sweet, private time. Um, but, but for me, what I discovered is the whole time you're sitting there in the midst of the quiet, you feel an urgency to rush. Because the enemy's telling you, you get over here, you can do that. You've got to go do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. And you have to learn to just ignore every prompting to go do whatever. Uh, if you're, you're sitting at home doing this, I can promise you, um, yes. you're, 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 the urgency to go do the laundry, yep. the urgency to go do dishes, the urgency to go out and wash your car, the urge, everything feels like it's got to be done right now. That's right. And now I don't, I don't have time for this. Yeah, exactly. Right. I've got to go. Right. When in fact, none of those things need to be done right now. It's a lie. 
but it, it feels real. And I'm telling you, it tugs on your heart in a major way. And so I would just tell you that uh, rushing to finish, then sometimes we just have a racing mind. Uh, and so one of the things that I learned that really helped me is as I was trying to do that, I had a little notepad with, with me and, and an idea would come, something I got it done. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't forget this. I can't. So I literally would just jot down on the notepad. You got to do this. Boom. Then I'd go back. And then something else came. I'd write that down too, knowing I could relax. I, I could let it go exactly. because I'm not going to forget it. I've got it written down. Right. And so that was another thing that helped me. Um, another thing, you know, is... Uh, let me just tell you, you know, we all have schedules. We all have a thousand things we got to get done in a day. Yep. All of those things are going to come into your mind. That's right. Everything. You know, you, you, you've got to be out of here. Um, you've got to get to the dentist. You've got to get here. You've got to get here. You've got to get here. And all of that stuff is just clutter. The enemy's throwing at you to keep you from being able to fully get to the center of God's presence and fully meditate with him. Uh, it's not apart from him. Everything is with him. Right. And so just knowing that, uh, and then I would just tell you all of our devices. Come on. So when... Turn them off. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, and I mean everything. Uh, yeah. Yes, first one, first one that comes to our mind is um, the phone turn it off don't be picking it up looking at it but the television mm -hmm. shut it off yes the radio shut it off now you know what i'm i'm not i mean i wouldn't be opposed if you, if you've got um, Christian music in the background Absolutely. quietly playing that I think that's okay as long as it's not distracting you. yeah exactly right. if it's keeping you if you're focused on the music and not on entering in the presence of God then shut that off too um, but just know that every device in your house in fact I would say this find a room where you're not going to be distracted <coughs> where you're not going to be interrupted and i and for some of us that may be a very hard thing to do you know tim there there is this beautiful correlation in scripture and i really didn't have time to get into this but um let me give you just two examples here anytime you start reading about meditation and scripture there's a very interesting thing, thing that happens one of the times we read about it is in the book of habakkuk and it's really interesting it talks about how he's he's praying and he's going to meditate in the lord and do you remember what he does it says that he climbed up to the watchtower to wait upon the lord or, or to dwell in the lord okay well what does that actually mean he went away from every distraction, he's the only one at the top of the watchtower. He's all by himself. So he intentionally knew, if I'm going to meditate on God, if I'm going to hear his voice through meditative prayer, I have to get away from everything else. You also go to uh, uh, you, the Psalms. Uh, there's also some other Old Testament examples. But when you're reading the Psalms, uh, when it starts talking about meditation, it immediately says after that I went to the field to meditate. I went, it's removing yourself from the chaos or uh, the things that might hinder you uh, from hearing God. Yeah. yeah, I would tell you that if I don't do that, it's, it, it, right. it's not going to happen. Right. We do have to separate ourselves from. And, and for me, another thing that I've learned that's changed my prayer life. Uh, and I, as I've shared this over the years with other people, I was surprised that they hadn't heard this. And so I'll share it. Probably most of our, our folks will know this. But I don't pray in my mind. I'm not able to do that. So I always want to try to find a place. And I, don't, I, I may whisper my prayer, but I, I'm in a, in a place where I can whisper or speak out loud, and I'm not worried about anyone else hearing what I'm saying, because for me, I can stay focused on my prayer when I'm praying out loud. When I'm doing it in my head, I get lost. I, I go over here for a while, and then I go, oh my goodness, I gotta pull it back in. I, but if I'm praying out loud, 
I am focused, I am there, I'm in the presence of God, and the conversation just continues without interruption. Now, there's one more thing that I think is a hindrance, and that, and that is a feeling that we have that we're not good enough or that we don't know enough um, about how to pray. And there's a story that, this is a story that changed my life and it helped me tremendously and, I, and I'm excited to even share this story. It's not mine, it's in the book by Richard Foster, but it's in his first chapter about prayer. And what, and, he, and Brian, when your kids were growing up, did your kids ever draw pictures for you and you know with coloring and they went outside of the lines and they were all over the place Absolutely. and they bring it to you and they say daddy this for you what did you do with that picture i loved it and i put it on the refrigerator absolutely <laughs> so what richard foster says is just as a child cannot draw a bad picture neither can a child of god pray a bad prayer isn't that great? So it helped me to just stop worrying that the things I was saying to God weren't fitting the pattern. I mean, it wasn't the same. You know, people that I knew that who had been praying for 30 years, and I'd only been praying for a couple years at that time, and I listened to them, and I go, oh, my goodness, I shouldn't even be praying because I can't pray like that. Well, the other thing that he says is pray as you can not as you can't. That's so good. And I love that. That's so good. And so when I began to offer up prayers, I stopped worrying about what God thought about it because it was a gift from me to him. I loved being with him. I loved being in his presence. And I just pictured my prayers being hung up on his refrigerator. You know, even though they're a mess, they're all over the place. They're crazy uh, until you learn because, you know, it's one of those things you get better at the more you practice it. But in the beginning stages, he's just loving it that you're praying. And so for the folks who are listening to this, if you're struggling in your prayer life, I just want you to understand, you can't offer up a bad prayer. Just share what's on your heart, tell him what you're thinking, and just have that intimacy with him because he's he's there he's taking it in he's hanging in on his fridge i know that's not the way it is i love but the image of that that. helped me to be able to just step through the the resistance and just go pray with him and be with him knowing that he's loving it just dwell in his presence yes yeah and we even two weeks ago talked about when you pray you should pray with confidence knowing that your father loves you and, and knowing that you're not doing anything wrong in your prayer here, just talk to him, be with him. Absolutely. You should, you should have that kind of confidence, yeah. not even worried about, am I doing something right? Or Yeah, sometimes I even say, you know what, God, filter it. <laughs> That's right. You know, I got some raw emotions right now that I'm pouring out. Would you, would you just filter it and, right. and, 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 and bring this place, bring this prayer to the place where it should be? Right. Um, you know, uh, about nine or 10 months ago, I went on this, I went on a trip. My dad lives in Alabama. It's about a 10-hour drive. And I was making the drive all by myself. It was just me in the car. And I would just tell you, it was one of the most precious trips because I didn't turn on the radio. The entire trip, the whole 10 hours, was just me and God. And it was quiet. It was, we were just on the road, so you know, you're, you're not really focusing on anything. You didn't have any noise in the background. Uh, and I would just tell you, it was precious. It was amazing. I'd love to do it again because I just felt his presence the whole way there. And we just conversed about everything. Uh, you know, even things that I was seeing in the road. Lord, isn't that cool? Look at that. And, and just bringing him into the car with me, letting him be a part of my trip. That's the definition of dwelling or abiding in the Lord. It is. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. It's awesome. Tim, I want to end our time uh, very briefly, but I just want to, I want to make a, a very quick point to all those who are watching. Um, if you want to start practicing biblical meditation, I just want to say a couple things. One, please understand, um, like if you're wondering, well, how do I really start doing that? You need to throw out any cultural or secular ideas. 
I don't mean any, I don't mean anything rude by this, but, um, you don't need to start practicing yoga. <laughs> you don't need to sit with your legs crossed and your hands like this. No, th- those all come from false religions. <laughs> that That's not what biblical meditation is. Um, biblical meditation is as beautiful as what we've already tried to paint here. Get to a quiet place. Retreat. Begin to embed yourself into God's word and start getting God into your heart. You can do that a number of ways. You can read a passage. You can pray. You can sit and meditate on the beauty around you, on his creation. And then I would even, I would, this is how we kind of ended the message, but you might take that time to one, just sit in peace. You don't need to do anything. You might not even need to pray. Just be. You know, some, some of the most beautiful and intimate times I've had with my wife are when we're just sitting together. We're not even talking. <laughs> we're just sitting together, enjoying the day, you know, whatever that is. I would like to think God's the same way. He's great just dwelling with you. <laughs> uh, but you could also use that time to just say, God, I've kind of been struggling in some areas. Can we talk about that? That's meditation. That's biblical meditation. And then you can start embracing biblical truths over those things in your life. You can even, man, as, as, as you're starting to like dwell in the Lord, start welcoming his peace into your heart or into a certain situation you're having at work that's bringing you stress. Invite, invite him in. And then for me, here's, here's, the, here's a difference. I'm not saying it's the difference. But here's a difference. Like if someone was to say, what's the difference between prayer and meditation? Well, there is a difference because there's different words (laughs) and scripture uses them differently. Oftentimes, I think in prayer, we are asking God for something, whether that's something we want to see in our lives or, yeah, Father, give me more of you, but we're asking for something. A lot of times with meditation, though, I think that's where we can start experiencing the transformation. So maybe through prayer, you've asked for something, but now as you sit in peace, as you contemplate on the goodness of God, that might be where you actually start hearing God say, let's start making this change in your life. Let's get rid of this habit that you have. You know know how you've been using your, your mouth lately? It hasn't glorified me. To me, it's in that biblical moment of meditation where you might actually start hearing about the transformation that God's going to bring to your life. Yeah, I agree. You know, I I was at a conference years and years ago, and and, and it it was um, the 10 steps of a dream. What's interesting is the first couple steps is the dream begins in the mind of God. And he's looking for somebody on planet Earth to take it and run with it. I feel like in those moments when we are dwelling with God, and yes, you know, we're doing what we talked about. We're internalizing and and personalizing his word, but also we're, we're, we're talking. It's a, it's a two way conversation, but if, if we're doing all the talking, that's more like the prayer side of things. But this is, this is a, this is a conversation where it's back and forth and where we sit and we listen. And I believe that when we take some moments to sit and listen, that he will begin to unpack some of those dreams that that he has for us. And in the midst, so in the midst of meditation, in the midst of listening, Mm -hmm. I believe that some really cool ideas can be downloaded, things that he wants, maybe changes that he wants from us that will benefit us as we go forward but also maybe some dreams and some ideas of things he wants to see us accomplish that if we're not listening and if we don't take time to listen we may not ever hear so i just i love that A, a lot of people might not know this but as a senior pastor one of my roles is to uh try to decide what we're going to be preaching on each sermon series each topic what a lot of people don't know is, Tim, I don't choose what we're going, what I'm going to teach on based on what I want to talk on. Yeah. If people knew my routine, I actually sit in silence, 
a form of biblical meditation, and I just listen. I don't talk at all. I'm not praying. I'm not saying, God, would you give me this? I'm just sitting. And as God, as I sit there and wait upon the Lord, he starts speaking, impressions start coming into my heart and mind, and I just start writing them down. So I, I don't even preach what Brian wants to preach. Through biblical meditation, I try to listen for God's voice. And this, this actually goes back to that story in Habakkuk that I mentioned, and what I love so much about it. So he retreats to the watchtower, but then it says he just waited. He didn't pray. He had already prayed. <laughs> He sat there and he literally waited to hear God's voice. That's biblical meditation. That's it. He just waited to hear from the Lord. That's and you awesome. put yourself in his presence. That's right. And, and, and you know, in fact, um, this was in Richard Foster's books. I, you know, I wish I could claim credit for all these. I, I can't. But one of the things in his book, and I loved it because when I first say it, it's going it, 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 to, you may go, well, wait a minute. But it says, uh, you know, you know in, in meditation, it's being willing to waste time with God. Now, so think about that. It's good, though. It is saying, I'm willing to put everything aside to sit in silence with him, even though in my mind there's 20 things I'm being told I have to get done right now right. or the world's going to end, you know, and it won't. But right. it's being willing to sit and say, I am willing to be here with you, God. And if we just sit here together and we don't either one even speak, we're together. That's right. And it's okay. And I'm willing to do this because I love you that much. So good. That's so good. I wonder how we as Christians would feel if we set aside an hour to meditate or dwell upon the Lord. And we left feeling like we didn't hear anything. Shouldn't we at least be thrilled that we sat with the Lord for an hour? Even if we don't feel like we came away with some transformative thought or some renewing of the mind, at least we could say, I was in the presence of the Lord and that's enough. That's enough. Brian, I wish I could tell you. I mean, my goal is that most days I'm able to do that, but I'm not. So I'm just being honest. I'm human. I'm not. But, but when I go a couple days and I haven't been in that place where I feel like I have been drawn in to the center of his presence and we're just being together. Yeah. Now, a lot of those times conversations going back and forth both ways. Right. But if I'm not there... I miss it and I get to a point where it's like if I've gone a couple days it's like I've got to figure out how to get make room because I can't do this without him I can't I don't want to not be in his presence and and I think that just comes from practice and having done that for so long in my life because at first it will be awkward you'll 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 sit there and go I don't think I can do this I don't think anything's being accomplished I'm not getting anything done you just have to fight through that but it's not about getting things done it's about being with our savior yeah Whew, you're going to make me tear up on that one man that's incredible Love you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with me, and uh, and for all of those watching. Um, uh, yeah, just your testimony there of faith and your love for the Lord, uh, and that that is just such a testimony for each one of us that to get to a place in your life where if you've gone without dwelling in the Lord for a day or two, to just have this longing yeah. to be in His presence. Thank you for sharing that. My Absolutely. Friend. Absolutely. So, Tim, this is hard to say, but our time is up. Okay. <laughs> I wish we could keep going. You have a final thought, could I, Tim? Can I just Please share do. one more thought with Please you? Please do. I, yes. I, I want to share a scripture verse with you. Please do. And just tell you something that, we, you know, the way our world is today, it, it's turned upside down. Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of times when things aren't going in life the way we would. And we can find ourselves going into a, a depression. And I want to share just a thought on meditation that I think 
it's helped me tremendously. And so when I'm feeling blue, um, there's a scripture verse, and it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. It said, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. One of the things I've been learning to do in the last couple of years is to sit down and meditate and to, to, to look at the promises of God um, or some of the scripture verses where it talks about what is to be, what's going to happen in the future. And I begin to meditate, God, what, what would that be like? What will be, you know, um, let me just throw one at you. You know, um, it talks about how the saints are going to come back with Christ when he establishes his reign on the earth. And we're going to come back with him riding these white stallions. Yeah. I mean, can you just for a moment meditate on that alone? Exactly. What is that going to be like? <laughs> exactly. We're on flying horses. We're, gravity, we're not subject to gravity. We are following King Jesus. Um, what's it going to be like to be riding on a horse like that? Is that horse going to be our horse so that we can travel back and forth from heaven to the earth throughout the millennium? Right. I mean, I mean, there's just, so many things. We right. could, you could go all That's over right. the place, That's right. you know, looking at those kind of promises. And so what I'm learning to do is just sound, is sit down and say, you know what, God, I read this today, <laughs> and I've never really thought about this. But I want to think about it with you today. So good. Well, I can't wait to ride on that white horse with you. That's right. I can't wait to see you, at, you know, establish your kingdom. I can't wait. And, and you know, the, it tells us, you know, no eye has seen, no. nor ear, ear heard, That's right. nor heart of man conceived what God has prepared for them who love him. Amen. We can imagine the most incredible things. Yeah. And we won't even be close. That's right. So for us to dwell with God, thinking about the promises that are waiting for us, that helps me to push aside this, the crazy temporary stuff that we're facing now That's right. and focus on the eternal. And that brings my mind back to a place it brings where peace it needs to be. And yeah. hope. Peace and hope That's and right. comfort, knowing that all things are going to end well. Amen. That is a beautiful note to end on. Tim, thank you for being a part of this podcast. I really appreciate you, my friend. You are welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Will you come back and join us again? I can't wait. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Hey, friends, uh, I just uh, I just first want to tell you, I, I just love you, and I'm so grateful that uh, you are tuning into these podcasts. I think all of us are learning so much together, and it really provides us the opportunity to just go deeper each week. So thank you. Hey, before, uh, before you log off, uh, would you consider liking and sharing uh, this podcast? We just... We honestly believe that the Holy Spirit is uh, is in in these conversations, and that just by you sharing this, that this might get into to the ears of someone who really needs to hear it. Friends, uh, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you again here next week at Beyond the Sermon. Go in peace. Mm-hmm.